Because so so when we do the organization yeah. thing, we might keep it. So what? Because we'll offer it. We'll record it on the time. Just that, um, and I left this year. I thought, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I just, it Rules Committee, come to order, and thank you very much for joining us uh, again today for the Rules Committee to, commit to consider H.R. 6691, Community Safety and Securities Act of 2018. Earlier this year, in the United States versus EMEA, the Supreme Court ruled that a clause in the U.S. Code which defines, and I quote here, crime of violence is unconstitutionally vague, meaning that the court, in this case the Supreme Court, would have made a call to which crimes 
and I quote here, involved a substantial risk, end of quote, of physical force. It is therefore necessary for Congress to specify circumstances when a criminal offense should be deemed, and I quote here again, a crime of violence. Mr. Chairman, I have received uh, probably more briefing than other people have on the committee about examples, and I'm sure you will include that in your testimony, but I understand well why we are here today. It comes as a request that the court had made to Congress to offer clarification about the vagueness of a law. H.R. 6691 maintains the current definition of crime and violence that includes offenses that, and I quote again, as an elements, the use, attempted use, or threatened use of physical force against the person or property of another, end of quote. This legislation eliminates vagueness. It addresses the United States Supreme Court's concerns and preserves what we might know as the status quo through accepting the court's offer and I think uh, polite uh, politely asking us to make sure that we do not offer vague legislation. So, this bill explicitly states that crimes of violence to avoid confusion, which are, it, 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 it states which offenses are crimes of violence to avoid confusion. This includes crimes that courts have found to be violent in nature, such as voluntary manslaughter, attempted kidnapping, lewd acts upon a child, sexual assault, burglary, and assault on a police officer. The Community Safety and Security Act reinstates the ability of law enforcement to protect American citizens. I think what we have done here by putting those who commit serious crimes behind bars while ensuring that criminal laws clearly lay out what types of conduct are subject to higher penalties and that could result in additional time in prison. The primary duty of the federal government is to keep Americans safe, but it is also to make sure that Congress and the law comply with the Constitution, and that is by review of the court and that's what they did, and that is why our young chairman, the gentleman from Virginia, as the chairman of the judiciary, is here today. I think it's imperative that we have members like Bob Goodlatte who are able to take this not as a challenge, but rather as an opportunity to make sure the loopholes are quickly enhanced for the security of our communities. So, Mr. Chairman, before we come to you and the gentlewoman from Texas, I'm going to yield to the distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts. Distinguished gentleman is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but before, before I proceed to my statement, I just want to I want to inform the committee that uh, it's Elsie Hastings' birthday today. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. Eighty-two. Wish you a happy birthday. Thank you. Eighty-two. Thanks a lot. Another day old and deeper in debt. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I know he can't think of any, any better birthday president than to be here at the Rules Committee. So uh, anyway, happy birthday. Thanks. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, this bill and the process that got us here today uh, are a mess, quite frankly. Uh, H.R. 6691 was introduced last Friday when, when members were in their districts. There haven't been any hearings on it, no markups. I doubt many members have had time to evaluate it, let alone hear from experts about its impact. And members likely won't have an opportunity to fix the bill on the floor. That's because uh, it's expected to be considered under yet another record-breaking closed rule, the Republicans' 96th closed rule of this Congress. You know, changing legal definitions has an impact. Real lives will be affected. Yet we have no real idea what the ramifications of redefining, quote, crime of violence in the criminal code would be. This is crazy. It's a recipe for increased injustices and unintended co consequences. Why the rush, uh, Mr. Chairman? 
It's irresponsible to so hastily consider a bill of this magnitude. Let me uh, propose something radical. Bring back, uh, bring regular order back from the dead. Uh, let the Judiciary Committee do its job, hear from experts, hold a hearing, hold a markup, and once this bill has been vetted properly, let's have a more accommodating process with amendment debate on the floor. The world's greatest deliberative body should actually debate. I don't know why that's such a radical idea in this Congress. There was a report in this morning's Politico, Politico uh, and I quote, uh, it says, House Republicans stalling appro appropriations mini bus package, end quote. There is 10 legislative days left, counting today, until the government runs out of money. It is beyond me why you are considering such an important bill at lightning speed while, reporting, uh, re by re while reportedly slowing down consideration of an appropriations bill to keep the lights on. Uh, you guys are in control of this place, uh, but I hope we'll be meeting sooner rather than later on an appropriations package. Uh, that's what we should be focusing on, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. As a matter of fact, we took you up on the same advice that you gave us today, and that's what we did yesterday when we went through a bill that had regular order. I want to thank Ms. Torres and the gentlewoman from Wyoming for their great work on the bill that they did, the bipartisan bill that was done yesterday. Today, we are joined by Ms. Jackson Lee. We're joined by the young chairman of Judiciary Committee, Chairman Goodlatte. Mr. Chairman, we're delighted that you're here and you're recognized before. However, before I do that, let me say this. Anything you brought in writing without objection will be entered in the record so that our awesome stenographer makes sure she completes the record accordingly. Jim's recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And as I get ready to depart from the Congress, I'm honored that you still refer to me as the young chairman. Chairman Sessions, Ranking Member McGovern, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today as you Consider the rule for H.R. 6691, the Community and Safety Security Act of 2018, a bill designed to address a recent Supreme Court decision that creates loopholes in our criminal justice system. In 1984, Congress passed the Comprehensive Crime Control Act, which did a number of things to reform and improve federal criminal laws, including providing a definition of crime of violence, which was incorporated into various new provisions in the criminal code. In the ensuing years, several federal laws have incorporated this definition, and it has become somewhat ubiquitous in criminal law. A search of the criminal code reveals more than two dozen cross-references to 18 U.S.C. Section 16. In the past years, however, confusion has arisen around this definition in federal case law. As codified, 18 U.S.C. Section 16 contains a two-pronged definition of a crime of violence. Specifically, the term includes both one an offense that has as an element the use, attempted use, or threatened use of physical force against the person or property of another, and two, any other offense that is a felony and that by its nature involves a substantial risk that physical force against the person or property of another may be used in the course of committing any offense. This second prong, called the residual clause, has been particularly challenging for courts which have struggled to assess whether certain criminal offenses carry a substantial risk of physical force and are therefore crimes of violence. In attempting to interpret and apply this second prong, courts reach disparate conclusions over the scope of these terms, often reaching questionable results. This year, in a case called Sessions versus DeMaia, the Supreme Court addressed the issue head-on and ruled that this substantial risk clause in the crime of violence definition was unconstitutionally vague. Recognizing this decision throws a wrench into the criminal code, Justice Gorsuch, in his concurring opinion, counseled, just as Blackstone's legislature passed a revised statute clarifying that cattle covers bulls and oxen, Congress remains free at any time to add more crimes to its list. Congress has done almost exactly this in other laws, and what was done there could be done here, end quote. And that is what we are doing. The Community and Safety Security Act directly addresses the Supreme Court's concerns in DiMaia by enumerating the offenses that should be considered crimes of violence. While maintaining the current definition provided in the existing first clause of the definition, the bill replaces the residual clause with a list of offenses including voluntary manslaughter, attempted kidnapping, lewd and lascivious acts upon a child, sexual assault, burglary, and assault on a police officer. 
in developing this bill. The committee worked closely with the Department of Justice, taking into account recent federal case law. The department supports this legislation. And I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Handel of Georgia for her strong work on this important legislation. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify before the committee. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Very clear. Ms. Jackson Lee, welcome. Thank you very much. recognized. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Section 18. This bill would expand the definition of crimes of violence in Section 16 in two ways. One, by enumerating certain offenses that do not currently exist under federal law to be recognized as crimes of violence for federal purposes, by adding alternative definitions to already existing federal offenses in order to have these new definitions also qualify as federal crimes of violence. I'm deeply concerned about this bill because it attempts to redefine crime of violence under 18 U.S.C. Section 16B in such a reckless manner. The ranking member is correct. We've had no hearings. Uh, we have had no experts. Uh, we've had no basis for, at this point, uh, submitting and introducing this legislation, which was introduced, I would say, in the last four to five days. The recent Supreme Court decision of DeMaia versus Sessions held that subsection B of section 16, known as the residual clause, is unconstitutionally vague. It is something we need to fix. But let me for a moment uh, deviate from my text and say that uh, I've noted that a documentary dealing with Trayvon Martin is now playing, and it recounts uh, the process of a state proceeding dealing with Mr. Zimmerman and uh, Trayvon Martin. Maybe if we had had hearings and might have listened to the family of Trayvon Martin even though this is a state case, we might have been able to delineate an action that could have warranted Mr. Zimmerman being brought to justice. As it was, he was not. He had the gun, a young teenager, African-American, was dead. Is that a crime of violence? Maybe one could have discerned that uh, to be a crime of violence uh, based upon how Trayvon lost his life, walking down the street with Skittles uh, and some iced tea. Uh, then attacked by an adult uh, who was not authorized to proceed as a law enforcement officer. I offer that because when we think of criminal cases or criminal law or reform of that, we must think of the victim and we must also think of the perpetrator. In any event, we are talking about a question of the loss of either your life or the loss of your liberty. And therefore, when we add a bill such as this, the issue of life and liberty must be of concern. Someone will be convicted under this expanded definition of a crime of violence. In response to the Supreme Court, my colleagues are now putting forth this bill. Rather than proceeding through regular order by having a hearing to ascertain relevant information from experts that will help us establish the best approach for dealing with the constitutionality of Section 16, and the federal definition, definition of crime of violence. No markups were had to allow amendments germane to the bill's purpose. Again, one's life or uh, one's uh, health is taken away through a crime of violence and then one's liberty. And so one would want to be more than accurate uh, in both cases for the violence that is against a victim and the perpetrator as to whether or not this person committed a crime under this particular statute. Instead of taking the time to fashion a definition that takes into consideration the many legal ramifications of changing this term as proposed, the bill sponsors are haphazardly pushing forward an overly expansive definition of a crime of violence for political purposes. The bill, therefore, is one, overbroad, two, unnecessary, and three, could have substantial harmful effects. First, the bill is overbroad and includes in its list of crimes of violence a number of offenses that have no element of violence in many instances. Burglary, for example, is included in the enumerated list of crimes of violence, though it could simply mean remaining in a building without authorization while they're there, forming the intent to commit even a minor offense. Teenagers do that a lot. Likewise, the bill lists coercion through fraud as a violent felony. 
None of this we would want to see. Though violence plays no part in that criminal offense, certainly people have been violated, but what would be the better way to be able to charge someone? The bill would also make simple assault as a crime of violence, even in circumstances where the underlying act is merely a push or a shove. One of the more egregious examples of an offense listed as a crime of violence is fleeing, which is knowingly operating a motor vehicle and failing or refusing to comply with law enforcement officers' signal to bring the motor vehicle to a stop, fleeing or attempting to elude a law enforcement officer, depending on factual circumstances, this provision elevates what could have amounted to a traffic violation uh, instead of a crime of violence. By expanding the definition of a crime of violence, this bill dangerously leads to overcriminalization under current law. A crime of violence in Section 16 must have as an element the use, threatened use, or attempted use of force. The consequences of H.R. 6691 are dangerous, especially in the hands of this present Justice Department, which has displayed a general tendency to use a sprawling definition of violent crime to justify more arrests and prosecutions and longer prison sentences. Mr. Chairman, you are well aware of the work that uh, General Holder did uh, in helping to bring down crime and not having U.S. attorneys across America charge up every offense. They focus on the most serious offense. We now have a situation where de uh, defendants who may have some opportunity for um, uh, redemption or uh, restoration of uh, rehabilitation are now being charged with every man of offense. This could happen with this particular bill. The residual clause, while expansive, also required that the crime of violence be classified as a felony, but even that requirement has been removed by H.R. 6691. Second, a new definition of crime of violence is unnecessary even in light of DeMeyer. The court in DeMeyer held that the residual clause is unconstitutional but left in place subsection A, which defines a crime of violence as an offense that has an element, um, has an element the use, attempted use, or threatened use of physical force against the person or property of another. While not an ideal formulation, it can for now suffice as an adequate placeholder until Congress can undertake a more deliberate approach instead of a reflexive one. Third, changing the definition of a crime of violence can have significant exclusionary effects for criminal justice reform legislation. There are proposed legislation that exclude people convicted of a crime of violence from pretrial release consideration, expungements of crimes, and receiving visitors. Unnecessarily expanding who is ineligible for these provisions is both unwise and counterproductive to the goals of reforming our criminal justice system. Again, I respect life and liberty. I certainly adhere to those who've been victims and perpetrators need to be brought to justice. But it needs to be done in a way that we also recognize the life uh, and the liberty of the perpetrator who may be accused unfairly under the interpretation of this particular statute. It is important for Congress to recognize the importance of criminal justice reform and do it in a comprehensive, fair, and just manner. Uh, for these reasons, I oppose the bill. I thank the chairman, the ranking member. Uh, I thank the chairman of the Judiciary Committee and the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you uh, had indicated that you had worked with the United States Department of Justice on this language, uh, the, the specific words, the specific intent, and that which uh, they believed would forthrightly satisfy not only a challenge by the court of making it more specific, but you believe that it, it, it in particular offered the judgment of the charge. Is that correct? Uh, uh, this has not been hasty. I mean, once the Supreme Court entered that decision a few months ago, we've been working on this ever since then with the Department of Justice. Uh, this isn't revolutionary. Uh, it's preserving the status quo prior to this uh, uh, Sessions versus DeMaia Supreme Court case. And we are, in fact, doing what the Supreme Court uh, suggested we do, namely, resolve the vagueness by enumerating the statutes that constitute uh, violent crimes. Uh, with regard to the fleeing issue that uh, Ms. Jackson Lee referenced, the uh, fleeing definition uh, they claim is too vague as written, 
Uh, could subject someone who is, say, pulled over for speeding but takes the time to find a safe spot to pull over to being charged with a violent crime. But uh, at least the uh, 11th and 8th circuits have already ruled that fleeing was a crime of violence, so we're not expanding anything. And if someone is just driving to pull over somewhere safe, they wouldn't have the mens rea, the necessary criminal intent to be convicted of fleeing. They must have a specific intent to elude law enforcement and merely going to find a safe place to pull over is not failing to comply. Uh, so for these reasons, I think this is a, a, a carefully thought out, well worked on bill to address a sudden problem that was created by this Supreme Court decision and uh, needs to be addressed so that this law does not uh, uh, proceed without uh, any effectiveness when we can easily make it effective again very quickly by simply specifying the crimes we are referring to when we say crimes of violence. Mr. Chairman, the courts around the country and will take note of these changes, as will law enforcement. Do you believe that it will effectively help to alleviate something that might be vagueness literally on behalf of a citizen uh, that would help them in circumstances that today might have been misapplied? Absolutely. In fact, uh, some people felt that it was vague before the Supreme Court ruled. Once the Supreme Court ruled, the, the, the statute was uh, rendered uh, ineffective, and we're trying to simply restore it to its effectiveness. It's not an expansion of the law. Uh, because all of these definitions are based on existing case law, uh, and it's, in my opinion, simply a responsible fix that merely returns us to the status quo prior to the Sessions versus DeMaia case. Thank you very much. Distinguished gentleman. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me. Does gentleman, gentlewoman seek time? I would. I would the gentlewoman is recognized. Seek time. Yes, ma'am. Um, let me say my, my friend and colleague has indicated two circuits. There are more than two circuits uh, throughout the United States uh, that have, uh, may have indicated an affirmation of this bill or this approach. Secondarily, as I mentioned in my remarks, um, there is new additions, burglary, um, coercion, and simple assault. Uh, none of these uh, have had hearings or expert witnesses that would offer uh, any thoughts on how best to address that question. And, of course, um, I appreciate the fact that uh, there has been work on this uh, with uh, the Republican Department of Justice, which is, of course, the government that is in charge. And as I heard in the hearings this morning on the Supreme Court justice, elections count. But uh, we are bipartisan on the Judiciary Committee. Some may be surprised of that. And I don't know who was engaged on our side of the aisle, certainly it's the first time that I've heard of this legislation, uh, to be able to look at how this impacts criminal justice reform. Um, and so I would just uh, indicate uh, that uh, with a bill just introduced on Friday um, and with new additions to it, I think that this is a problem. Uh, also, um, this... Uh, uh, fleeing is also, I mentioned that already, fleeing is also that. And let, let me just say this. Um, we're not out on the streets. Uh, we hope we're not the perpetrators. Uh, God help us not to be victims, but we know our constituents are. We know our constituents are also individuals that are charged. And I've worked with people in this Congress who understand that we have to find a way to make sure the criminal justice system works squarely and fairly to ensure that individuals who are charged um, are the ones who perpetrated it and that they understand fully what the charge is. A burglary, a crime of violence to the extent that um, you could be in a building. I don't like burglary either, but crime of violence is um, a, a major charge. And so I think it would be important when the Congress speaks on criminal justice reform, it is bipartisan. It is through factual research and uh, expert witnesses, including victims, including victims. We have had none of that. And so the Supreme Court, the, uh, the lack of clarity in that decision uh, is one that we should correct. But we should correct it, I believe, 
uh, with the appropriate tools of regular order, and we have not done that. And I am a little bit shocked at the fleeing. Uh, this is all in the interpretation of the law enforcement officer, <coughs> of whom we have great respect. But each law enforcement officer, when you have the word fleeing, can have you fleeing in one way and not be determined to have fled, and someone else fleeing, and it will be determined as having fled. I think that is a problem. And I thank the gentleman for yielding. Yes, ma'am. Distinguished gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate uh, uh, Chairman bringing this bill. I appreciate the words of the uh, gentlelady from, from Texas. Uh, whatever uh, you were working on, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, when you and your team put that statement together, it spoke uh, to me. Uh, do it that way again. Uh, when, when, if, when the would all uh, uh, vote is. Uh, is required. I can't take issue with, with much uh, that you uh, said. I share uh, many of your uh, sentiments and frustrations. Um, right up until we got to the part about, and it's particularly bad because this Justice Department is one that can't be trusted. We used to have a Justice Department that was doing things right, and now we have a Justice Department that, that isn't. I, I hope we don't have Republican and Democratic Justice Departments. I hope we have American Justice Departments, and I hope justice uh, remains justice. If, if we do have Democratic Justice Departments, that's not justice. And if we do have Republican Justice Departments, that's not either. I, I'd like you, to respond when you're finished. Uh, they, please. Um, that was not what I said. I don't think I used the word trust. If I did, I'd take my own words down. I didn't say the word trust. What I said is, under the Sessions Justice Department, it is a different approach to criminal justice. And that is uh, particularly criminal acts, criminal uh, violations. They are telling the U.S. attorneys to charge up, meaning to charge every single offense. Uh, what I've said under Eric Holder is that he asked the U.S. attorneys to use both their judgment and their discretion mm -hmm. and to charge the most heinous offense mm -hmm. and not to multiple charge, which gives the opportunity for the victim to be heard, but at the same time uh, does not overly layer the charges and overly incarcerate the individual who, as you well know, they are under now mandatory minimums. And all of us from both sides of the aisles, the faith community, have been working over the years, Chairman Goodlatte, mm -hmm. on this question of sentencing reduction because of mandatory minimums because we found that that was not an effective tool for preventing crime. So no, I did not use the word did not trust, uh, and I did not use the word Republican, I don't believe. I believe that I said the Sessions Justice Department, At, and that is far distinctive from trust and uh, not agreeing with uh, uh, having a disagreement with his approach. I want to stipulate that, that what the gentlelady is saying is true. I certainly didn't mean to, to, mis, uh, to mischaracterize. Uh, and I'd be happy for the uh, general Sessions to uh, adopt the approach uh, previously used, no matter what uh, party it was, but I'd be happy for him to consult with uh, former Attorney General. Well, and Paul. that's the nature of my of my question. Again, I, I, I agreed with almost everything you had to, to say. Certainly uh, remaining in a, uh, in a building is not what I think of as a, as a crime of violence. Uh, certainly uh, there's, uh, there's fleeing that doesn't seem violent to me, and there's fleeing that absolutely does. I count on prosecutorial discretion absolutely every single day. You recognize prosecutorial discretion in the Holder Justice Department as being a, a, a positive, my, my question is, what is it that leads you to believe that in the same way that we've always counted on prosecutorial discretion uh, to, to, to make the distinctions that you have recognized here, uh, why wouldn't you expect that, to, to, that prosecutorial discretion to serve us well in the future? Well, thank you for the question. Um, as you all know, as we all know, the first line of offense are our very fine law enforcement officers. They will be the first ones arresting an individual. Uh, so um, they, they have their understanding of the law. Uh, in this instance, these are federal laws, so crossing state lines would be involved in it, uh, but among other things. But the question then goes to the U.S. attorneys, uh, and the U.S. attorneys in their own way uh, can be influenced uh, by uh, the general. In this instance, it's the general sessions, which is um, hard on crime. Uh, and to use those laws and feel that they are less flexible, of less flexible opportunities to use their discretion than might be otherwise. I would hope they would do so. But to get to the real core of my opposition to the legislation is I think we'd be far better served 
if we had had hearings, if we have hearings in, in, uh, if we're fortunate enough to be reelected by our constituents, to have hearings going forward, to understand uh, and to decipher the new additions uh, that we have, the assault, the coercion, the, the burglary, um, so that whatever we give back from this Congress under federal law uh, is as great a tool as it can possibly be to remember what I said, to protect uh, the victim, and of course, because of who we are as a nation, the uh, perpetrator has rights as well, uh, and to make sure whatever that person is charged with uh, that they're not either overcharged or that it is not vague in itself or that it is not excessive to call burglary a crime of violence without other indicia. So uh, my point would be um, that we're not giving any legislative counsel to the U.S. Attorney because we've had no hearings. We'll have a debate on the floor. It'll be abbreviated. Mm -hmm. We've had no witnesses. We have no U.S. Attorneys come in. Uh, or we've had no chiefs of police come in. We have the FBI didn't come in to talk about this. And you could be working with the DOJ and you didn't have many Democrats working as well. And that's, I, I always believe that this work that I love, reforming the criminal justice system for the betterment of the victims and of the perpetrators, if you will, um, to make a system that is constitutionally sound, needs all voices to be heard. And that's why I think this bill is a problem. Yeah. Knowing that the gentlelady is a, is a leader on these issues, I'll, I'll share with you what I heard from, from law enforcement when I was home over the over the break, it has become common, not just at the federal level, but at the state and local level as well, to, to charge the highest offenses and not the, the lowest ones. And we're seeing uh, more and more police officers uh, dealing uh, with fleeing, dealing with uh, 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 violence during uh, an arrest, failure to comply. We're seeing more of those, those issues uh, as those crimes are no longer being charged. Uh, why charge uh, someone for, uh, uh, for fleeing when you're going to, to charge them for a, uh, for a higher crime anyway? And the answer turns out to be there, need, there needs to be a consequence if the law of the land is uh, uh, that, that, these, that these are, are crimes, failure to prosecute those crimes fail, fails to, to create consequences. I, I agree with the gentlelady about, uh, about hearings, and it is my hope that that, uh, that we will also have uh, have hearings on the on the wisdom of of what I see as a national movement uh, towards only charging those higher uh, crimes when when we fail to add a consequence uh, to running from a policeman, uh, we put communities at at at, uh, at risk. I see it in in my very diverse uh, community where folks are, have 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 mixed feelings about trusting the police these days. Some of those feelings are founded by news stories. Some of those feelings are 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 founded by uh, by other issues, but it, but the community is a more dangerous place because folks do not have that uh, trust. The the police officers are at more risk uh, and uh, have to approach uh, people differently uh, because they do not have uh, that that trust. And I I feel that uh, certainly law enforcement officers uh, who are outside of their uh, bounds uh, need to be dealt with uh, appropriately. I see men and women who have really given their entire working lives to trying to make our community stronger, trying to, to make children feel safer, trying to, to, uh, to, to bring order to, to, uh, uh, to, to parts of the community that, that, are, that are chaotic. They really believe uh, in, in, in you and me, and they feel less safe today because of a practice of not prosecuting uh, those uh, lesser offenses that make their job more dangerous day in and, and day out, and I... I Again, I know that's a local issue as well as a as a federal issue. But, Mr. Chairman, I just I, I, I share my heart uh, uh, with you in the concerns of, of my district because I couldn't I couldn't find two better leaders on issues of, of judiciary than the two of you. Well, I, and I agree with you. I, I just want to make it clear that uh, fleeing uh, and burglary, two of the things that have been mentioned here, uh, both absolutely present a substantial risk of violence to the person or property of another. And that's not, it doesn't mean that just the act of fleeing is going to be violent or a burglary is going to be violent. It is the question of whether or not those actions taken by somebody create a substantial risk of violence. By, and, and by that we mean harm to the person or property of another. So you can see that uh, fleeing the scene of a crime, even if it's a, even if it's a traffic stop, uh, we see some of the terrible things that happen when somebody takes off at 90 miles an hour and... Uh, 
crashes into another vehicle, causes harm to somebody, uh, destroys property. Same thing, breaking into a house uh, could destroy property in doing so. They could be discovered in there, and that could lead to violence. So that's why those things are specifically uh, referenced uh, in this uh, legislation and why we believe that they are very much uh, a risk of violence but type of crime. Would you concede, as the gentlelady has suggested, that there are examples we could find that uh, we as, as, uh, as, as conscientious men and women uh, wouldn't want uh, to elevate to oh, that crime of, of violence? Absolutely, there? and that's why the discretion exists in this. The, the prosecutorial discretion that exists today, you would expect to still uh, survive and be exercised Absolutely. tomorrow? Absolutely. I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentlelady. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back his time. Uh, the distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts. Yeah. Since it's Mr. Hastings' birthday, I'm going to be brief, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I, you know, um, there are lots of questions about this bill. Um, my understanding is that the federal public defenders have already come out in opposition to this bill. My guess is that there'll be more groups that will come out in opposition to this bill. There'll be more questions raised. And it goes back to the point I made in the beginning. You know, um, we ought to have regular order here. The committees of jurisdiction, not the rules committee, but the committee of jurisdiction ought to call witnesses, ought to question those witnesses, ought to have a good hearing, and ought to have a markup. Um, if I were on the Judiciary Committee, whether I was a Democrat or Republican, I think I'd be frustrated that a bill uh, that is important is coming to the floor without having gone through my committee. Um, I, I don't know, maybe you, I think maybe there's a philosophical difference on how this house should be run, uh, but I really do believe that committees are important and committees of, uh, of committees of jurisdiction I deliberate on the appropriate bills that come to the floor. Uh, and, um, and I have a feeling that uh, there'll be more issues raised and more questions raised uh, and um, you know, and. And I think it's. I think it's. This is not the way this house should be run. So I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Thank you very much. The distinguished gentleman from Alabama. I have a gentleman does not seek time. Uh, the distinguished gentleman. Happy birthday, Judge. Mm -hmm. Gentleman does not seek time. Ms. Torres. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I do seek time. Um, I would like to get some background on. Uh, on the urgency of this uh, proposed legislation. Um, so, you know, to the author of this bill, is this a knee-jerk reaction to a presidential tweet that we are trying to um, meet here? Uh, if the gentleman would yield, I'm not the author of the bill. The uh, gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. Handel, is. However, uh, we certainly at the committee worked with her, worked with the Department of Justice, and. Uh, it's not a knee-jerk reaction. We've worked for months uh, on this with the department, but it leaves an important statute uh, based on the Supreme Court decision uh, uh, without effect, and we need to restore that effectiveness, and we do it in a way that we think the Supreme Court will find to be constitutional, that will not be, uh, as they describe it, unconstitutionally vague by specifically spelling out uh, the uh, specific criminal acts that... Uh, contain in them a risk of violence. It seems odd to me that um, if indeed there has been months of work um, on, this, uh, on this legislation, um, why hasn't it gone through a committee process? Uh, I, I think the reason is that the uh, leadership uh, decided that they wanted to bring this bill forward before uh, the, the uh, uh, House adjourned and that uh, they wanted to, to move and uh, we responded and said a lot of work's been done We're ready to do that Before the House adjourns or before the November election uh, in this case uh, before uh, well You'll have to talk to leadership, but uh, we responded uh, with their request by saying that yes We felt this this legislation was ripe for consideration in the Congress and we're ready to move ahead It just appears to me um, that in moving um, this legislation forward so abruptly and um, once again violating our own rules of uh, um, not going through a process of committee hearings and uh, bringing people together, you know, it's also a slap in the face to um, the groups that have been working on, um, on these reforms 
you know, for not just for a few months, but, you know, for years and, and have been uh, demanding um, some reforms. Um, I was a 911 dispatcher for 17 and a half years, and I certainly, um, it's not easy uh, to hear the cries of, of victims um, and their plight for justice. Um, but I've also been a legislator in the state of California where we have had a terrible problem with overcrowding. Um, I represent three prisons, uh, state prisons in my district um, at the time, um, and had to deal with um, riots um, inside the prisons because there was simply no space, 150% uh, to capacity. Um, every state in the union is going through that right now. Um, we are the leading nation in the world in incarcerating um, you know, our citizens um, and it, it, it really, I think, is disrespectful um, to not th go through a process of committee hearings and not allow for um, people to be heard on, on these issues. And to say simply, and to state simply, um, crimes, violent crimes, such as um, assaults on police officers, rape and murder, um, no one is against incarcerating people for that, um, no one. Um, but it is shameful that we would not give justice the time to be heard uh, and people the time to be heard. And um, you know, people decide not to run for re-election, that's on their own. But to rush a bill simply because somebody's running out of time, I think um, we've really reached a new low um, in this house. Um, having said that, I... Uh, Ms. Torres? Yes. May, may I respond? I think, um, if I might, um, let me say that um, you have um, appropriately um, analyzed uh, the dilemma. I said mm -hmm. to you that uh, this bill has been introduced with one sponsor. Um, there are bipartisan negotiations going on on criminal justice reform, from prison reform to sentencing reduction, to in actuality a law enforcement trust and integrity bill that is languishing, ready to try to enhance police community relations. Um, we know that over the years, uh, members on both sides of the aisle have been concerned about mass incarceration. And we also know, and I'm looking at a, a CRS document, that really trying to clarify what a crime of violence then has been a dilemma by the courts and the Supreme Court, um, which would warrant this bill having hearings. Um, I, I, I hesitate to, to mention um, the, the opponent of, um, uh, in, in this particular member's case, is, is a, a lady, Miss uh, Macbeth, uh, whose son was killed um, wrongly. Uh, and I don't know if um, this bill is to respond to, to that. Um, but I, I, I just don't think there's a place to move a bill that draws confusion so quickly without the hearings that you have suggested, without the testimony of law enforcement officers. My good friend, Mr. Woodall, made a very valid point. We know that state laws have different charges on fleeing, but this is a federal. This will be a federal law. Uh, and so um, I would raise the question of why we're moving so fast on this legislation, and particularly where there's a question of clarity as to the three ones that I mentioned, fleeing, burglary, and, and coercive fraud. So you mentioned uh, a very Piracy. vital point. Piracy. Piracy. Yes. Is another one. These are all, you know, that have been listed. Some, have new, some are new, but I, I, I think this is a bill that could be subjected to uh, our reform in totality to make sure that it makes sense. I'm not sure that it does at this point. So thank you. Shoplifting, that could also, that is really, um, an option, how an officer, if, if so the discretion of an officer to um, how they are going to file um, a shoplifting uh, crime, whether it's going to be um, deemed as a burglary simply because the person was wearing uh, loose clothing. I mean, th this is stuff that really happens. Um, um, you know, it, it's I, I don't I don't consider that 
amusing. I think that we are encroaching in, in, in people's um, lives here, and um, we should not be rush, rushing a bill. We certainly should not be disrespectful to the process. Um, Mr. Goodlatte, you had a, a question for me? No, I just wanted to respond and say when you reference piracy, we're not talking about software piracy. We're talking about piracy, piracy okay. on the high seas, which okay. generally I think I people took it view as, as a crime of violence. I took it as a software piracy since um, this summer or earlier, in, late in the spring, early summer, I visited a veteran, a Vietnam uh, War veteran who had been deported uh, to Mexico, um, because, and his crime was um, selling of CDs. So uh, with that, I yield back. If I may, the uh, piracy, Mr. Uh, Chairman, is not really defined in the bill. I'm not sure where else. But in any event, um, I think you make a good point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in response to the gentlelady from California's comments about uh, overcrowding in prisons in California, I'd suggest California build some more prisons. I don't know if you've been to uh, San Francisco recently, but it's a pit. And it's a pit because you have criminals running around that aren't in prison. And to suggest that somehow law enforcement or the, the, the prisons are at fault for, uh, and, or this legislation is at fault for recognizing uh, the fact that we have ambiguity around crimes of violence and we need to take criminals, violent criminals, off the streets and put them behind bars, I think is a mistake. I, I commend the chairman for making sure we clarify this law and we uh, uh, deal with the ramifications of what the Supreme Court uh, has done. I have been in uh, law enforcement for years, and the reason that we now have, uh, or at least up until recently, we had a declining rate of, of violent crime in this country was because we built more prison beds, we had mandatory sentences, and we took dangerous people and repeat criminals off the streets. Uh, we are going to see, as a result of liberal policies in this country, an increase in violent crime. And I challenge any member of the other side of the aisle to talk to those uh, uh, victims and explain to those victims why they are now uh, victims of crime as a result of the uh, uh, repeat offenders and violent criminals being back on the street. Uh, I understand it takes a lot of tax dollars to incarcerate a, a human being. I also understand that if you are a victim of crime, if you're a victim of that burglary, if you're a victim of that assault, uh, it takes a lot of dollars to, to overcome that. And so we are disproportionately putting people in low-income areas at risk as a result of uh, uh, misguided policies about crime. And it happens throughout our country's history. Since the early 1900s, every time crime goes down, we have a bunch of people that feel bad for those poor criminals that are being incarcerated, and we, we let them out early, and we stop building prison uh, cells, and, and we, uh, and we uh, see an increase in crime. And that's what we're seeing right now is an increase in violent crime, and we're going to see it for the next decade until the American people rise up again and demand that their elected officials do something. And if you want to deal with crime, I, I, I was in law enforcement for 25 years. If you want to deal with crime, deal with the poor education system in California. Deal with the other, uh, deal with the single parent families who are raising children in California. Don't blame law enforcement and don't blame uh, the Bureau of Prisons or other officials for having to deal with the, uh, the effects of, of our society being broken. And, and I am, uh, as a law enforcement official, I take it very personally that uh, we have unfortunately uh, placed blame uh, in the wrong areas. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman. I thank the distinguished gentleman. Hold on just a moment, please. And the gentleman yields back his time. Does the gentlewoman choose, wish to seek time? Yes, I do. The gentlewoman would be recognized. Um, well, I certainly appreciate the gentleman's um, commitment to law enforcement and law and order. Um, you know, your state has an uh, even higher rate of incarceration than California. And... Um, I would never sit across uh, this dais from you and insult uh, any part of your state. Uh, San Francisco uh, is a great community, is a growing community. Uh, California is the fifth largest uh, global economy. I'm very proud of that. Um, the fact that um, I have pointed out 
that we have an issue here of lack of quorum, you know, doesn't mean that I am soft on crime or that I don't agree uh, with, you know, parts of what we're trying to do here. I'm simply saying that rushing um, a, a bill through without uh, fully vetting the process um, and, and having had a commitment um, and a group of people that have been committed uh, to doing some, not only prison reform, um, but sentencing reform, I think we owe uh, those folks something, and I agree with you. Uh, a victim of a crime is a victim of a crime, no matter how severe it is. Um, but the increase, in part, the increase of violent crime in our, in our nation um, has to deal with uh, the drugs, um, opioid abuse, that this Congress, that your own party, sir, has refused to uh, deal with up until you know, last year uh, when we actually put some money into a process of, of helping people get sober and not just simply uh, sending them to jail. Um, so I, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's my hope tomorrow, uh, part of your uh, dialogue with the uh, American public and members of Congress, which we speak to as we speak to the speaker on the floor during the rule and uh, during the debate is to also delineate what would not be included or what might have previously been included. Because I believe in looking at the list that is here, every single one of these fit. And I'm sure you could give us a list of the things which previously might have been subscribed to uh, that might have fallen under the term crime of violence that were excluded or potentially would have been excluded when you were specific about what you did. When I see voluntary murder, voluntary manslaughter, assault, sexual abuse, aggravated sexual abuse, abuse, sexual contact, child abuse, kidnapping, robbery, carjacking, firearms use, burglary, arson, extortion. These are all terms that I would, and it goes on and on, including domestic violence. That to me would be a crime of violence. So I, I'm not suggesting to you that what your testimony for this committee at all was lacking but I would hope that tomorrow you might, or Ms. Handel might be able to give an opportunity to delineate some of the things which might have fallen out, which would indicate the, the reasonableness of why what uh, a Supreme Court justice or the Supreme Court as a whole said when they said, please give us a better uh, delineation of those terms so that we understand crimes of violence. If you if you yes, would sir. allow me, I, I just say that you're correct, that uh, there were suggestions of things that uh, are not on that list, and I think that's a good idea. We'll, we'll be prepared to address that. But of course, what we're doing is we're replacing uh, a law that didn't have a list with a law that has a list to create uh, much more certainty and eliminate the vagueness that the court was concerned about. Well, and I think, and I appreciate the gentleman, I think that the uh, distinguished gentleman from Georgia made a point too, Many times, many of those uh, lesser crimes might not have been included, but they want to make sure that the ones where violence is used, that it actually delineated violence. So, I mean, I think it was a proper uh, use of term that the Supreme Court said. I think that if we're going to review the case, we better make sure it is a crime of violence. I've satisfied myself, and I think you did a marvelous job, and I'm delighted that the new member of Congress took this on Ms. Handel uh, in her uh, time that she's uh, bringing forth. Okay. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, if I might, in yes, closing, just for the record, uh, the FBI and the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the FBI uh, in 2018 indicated that violent crime has gone down 48 percent, and the Bureau of Justice Statistics says it has gone down 74 percent. Uh, doesn't mean that uh, there are not victims, but I do think we should acknowledge that some of the criminal justice reforms are, in fact, working. Would the gentleman lady yield? 
Uh, does the gentleman seek recognition? Yeah, I do. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what time period uh, have those statistics? I understand they were uh, reported in 2018, but over what time period were those uh, statistics gathered? Well, that's, that is the date of reporting. It is not the date at, at, at the time that, uh, for the gathering of the material. Those, those are 10-year statistics that the Department, that FBI is reporting, I would guess, um, because the, the violent crime rate has not gone down 48% um, in 2018. Are you Mr. Back? Would you yield, Mr. Bob? Thank you. I'm sorry. No, you're I, asking. Yeah, you're, he had okay. the time, and I was he just did. asking. He you. did. Yeah, I, in in your previous comment about liberal policies uh, contributing to this, how do you reconcile um, what I can report to you in my state? We have had a Republican governor for 20 years in the state of Florida. We've had a Republican legislature with a supermajority for 15 years in the state of Florida. Now, whatever has happened to crime during that period of time, um, uh, how, how many of us liberals were in a position uh, to cause it? Uh, and what, if anything, could the legislature have done that they did not do? Happy to answer both questions. Um, one, the crime rate in Florida, a violent crime rate in Florida has gone down uh, in the last 20 years. Um, I don't attribute that to uh, Republicans being in the legislature or uh, in the executive branch. I think there are plenty of misguided Republicans who are now supporting uh, proposals because of a, reduce, uh, a reduction in violent crime of, of uh, policies that will actually increase violent crime. And I, I think that is uh, unfortunate. Um, but I, I do think that we are looking um, as a country at a, a group of social ills that are uh, resulting in uh, crimes uh, and criminals uh, years later. I think our education system is broken, and I think if we don't give young people the ability to dream and to have a future and to have a skill set with which they can accomplish something in the future, they all too often uh, 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 deviate and, and choose a life of crime. The, cr the criminal, the, the crime rate in, in my a judicial district went down 50% for adults in my 10 years as district attorney and 75% uh, for juveniles. It didn't happen because we incarcerated our way out of a problem. It happened because we offered programs and incarceration. And I think that that is uh, the, the formula that, that others will adopt down the road. But I, I don't think it's a strategy of just incarceration. I do think it takes both uh, uh, programs, um, giving young people skills, giving them hope, uh, uh, making up for uh, too many single-parent families in, in our country at the same time that we put the most violent and uh, repeat offenders uh, behind bars. Would the gentleman continue to yield? I will. Just very briefly, I remind you that two-thirds of the states in this country are in the hands of our Republican governors. Um, and a substantial number of uh, the legislatures uh, follow that same practice. Uh, it's all of our uh, issues, and it's all of our responsibility. And I don't think that uh, Republicans or Democrats have caused all of the social ills of our society. So toward that end, um, I disagree with it just being liberal policies. I don't think you and I have very much um, uh, that um, we disagree with about uh, education, the need for jobs, and adequate housing in this country. That's universal. And toward that end, we would be better served uh, rather than finger pointing. Uh, and I might add your statistics on Florida crime are just plain wrong, and I'll talk with you more about it. I, I would love to learn more about it. But if you would not endorse me before my election in November, I would appreciate that, Judge Hastings. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Is there further the discussion? by anyone on the committee with uh, our distinguished panel today. I want to thank both of you for taking time to be here. Uh, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, Bob, did you get a chance, Chairman, did you get a chance to uh, offer this distinguished gentleman from Florida a happy birthday? I forget, or Ms. Jackson Lee, were you here when we acknowledged that the gentleman's birthday? Okay. Well, I, I, I want to take the opportunity. Sing happy birthday to him. <laughs> 
I want to take the opportunity. I will not sing, but I will certainly use as strong a voice as I can to say many more birthdays. Happy birthday. Thanks, Lord. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I think that these days come and go, yeah. and uh, with delight, it is your birthday, and congratulations. I want to thank, thank both of our panelists. If you'll please rank, make sure that uh, our, our uh, awesome stenographers look forward to receiving anything you'll give them to complete the record, and thank you very much. The um, committee made a decision today, I did, to uh, have a hearing today at 3 o'clock. Do we uh, need another member here? Well, that's fine. If you've, if you've got five. If you've got five. Uh, one, two, three, four, six. Okay, we have the correct uh, number here, so we may proceed. Uh, so at this time, uh, Chairman will be in receipt of a motion from the distinguished gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 6691, the Community Safety and Security Act of 2018, a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Judiciary. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. The rule provides one motion to recommit. Finally, Section 2 of the rule provides that it shall be in order at any time on the legislative day of September 13, 2018 for the Speaker to entertain motions that the House suspend the rules as though under Clause 1 of Rule 15, and that the Speaker or his designee shall consult with the Minority Leader or her designee on the designation of any matter for consideration pursuant to this section. Thank you very much. You've now heard the motion from the distinguished gentleman from Georgia. Is there, mo is there a yes. discussion or amendment to that distinguished yeah. gentleman from Massachusetts? So, Mr. Chairman, I, I move that the committee postpone consideration uh, of this resolution indefinitely. Um, this bill was introduced just a few days ago. It has not received a single hearing. It has not received a markup. There was no call for amendments. And not a single expert witness, advocate, or stakeholder has had the chance to weigh the effect it will have on our criminal code. Uh, we're beginning to get some opposition uh, uh, in the form of letters coming to our offices as we speak. Uh, and I'm, I'm urging that we uh, do this because we need to return to regular order. Uh, we should not consider this bill until the Judiciary Committee, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction, has held a hearing and a markup on the substance and the consequences of this bill. I just, you know, for the life of me, can't accept the fact uh, that we don't have time for a hearing or a markup. Uh, at some point, this institution has to work, uh, and that means that committees of jurisdiction have to do their job before we consider legislation here in the Rules Committee. So I would urge everybody to support me in this request, and maybe the speaker will get the message and we will return to regular order. Thank you very much. The gentleman has uh, an amendment. Is there further discussion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, gentleman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, if there was ever uh, a reason to have an open rule, uh, the circumstances and so far as the procedure uh, uh, that we are operating under for this uh, particular measure, 6691, uh, 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 bodes well for there to be an open rule in light of the fact that there have been no hearings, no mock-up, no discussions or uh, anything. Uh, it just materializes here be, uh, before uh, the committee. Um, uh, for the life of me, at the very least, if we had had an open rule, members might have been able to gather themselves and try to get a, uh, some information to offer up amendments. There were a couple of very serious uh, letters that came into our respective offices um, uh, of people complaining uh, about this particular measure. Um, I, I think it's uh, much ado about nothing, uh, the definition in and of itself of, uh, uh, that it seeks to clarify didn't need any clarifying. All of the things that are uh, discussed are already uh, are crimes. And even under the aegis of the Supreme Court decision, or uh, more specifically, Justice or uh, Associate Justice Kagan's uh, opinion uh, uh, speaks to uh, that clarity. But that said, uh, I support the gentleman's uh, motion to postpone this matter. This isn't as important as what we need to be doing here uh, to keep uh, the government running. And the uh, fact of the matter is, what you all are doing is running out the clock. I, suspect that we won't even 
uh, be here a couple of weeks in October. I understand what you're confronted with. We are too, and that is needing to get home and <coughs> campaign. But this is uh, just filler, and it's not right to do this. And hopefully when you do have your hearing on what should be included in a rules package uh, next uh, uh, term, uh, we need to do better to get back to regular order, and it's just that simple. I appreciate the uh, gentleman's dialogue. I, I think that it's important for us to remember that the United States Senate uh, was here over the month of August for a few days and have presented us with opportunities which we consider to be very valuable. We had in our uh, request to the United States Senate asked them if we took up bills, appropriations bills, would you, can we avoid the uh, appearances, uh, the desire by this body to complete its work, to not to get the last minute. And I, I think that that is what we're doing, which would take away the need for us to be here later in October. Chairman, you? So I, I think that is the important part of the takeaway that, that I would have. Yes, sir. Was this one of those measures that No, the sir. Senate what what I suggested to point. you, that the, what the Senate did they did rather than waiting till September or October, or was waiting till the last minute. So I think that that, that was what we were trying to do. I don't, I don't know why we would not take advantage well, of well, completing their would work. Well, then, would the chair agree? Then what we're doing is treading water when we do things like this. If the Senate didn't say we will take up 6691, if you all over there in the House will bring us all uh, 6691. And then we rush out here as if this is something um, with uh, real urgency to it. Well, that's not that's not I, the case. I, uh, the Senate didn't ask us to do this. Whoever it uh, originated uh, uh, with put um, uh, uh, the maker of the measure, the lady from Georgia, um, in in the position of having the chairman of the committee uh, say that you know we did it out of expediency. That's crazy. Well. It might be crazy to you, but I think that if you looked at a simple request that came from the Supreme Court where they talked about vagueness, I think ignoring that would be irresponsible. So vagueness is one word and opportunity is another, but I think we had a responsibility. Okay, we're now uh, debating the McGovern Amendment. Is there further discussion to the McGovern Amendment? Seeing none, vote now be on the government. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Uh, ask for roll no's call. Have, no's have it. Gentlemen, ask for roll call vote. Mr. Cole. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Collins. Mr. Byrne. No. Mr. Byrne. No. Mr. Newhouse. No. Mr. Newhouse. No. Mr. Buck. No. Mr. Buck. No. Mr. Buck. No. Ms. Cheney. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, five nays. The amendment's not agreed to, further than our discussion. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Mr. Chairman, Florida. I move yes, that we uh, uh, make this measure an open rule. Thank you very much. There's a uh, amendment on the, uh, on the uh, table now to make this an open rule. It's further discussion. Mr. Chairman, I would just add, uh, repeat what Mr. Hastings said. I mean, if we're not going to follow regular order, and if the Committee of Jurisdiction um, is not going to hold a hearing or a markup, then you ought to open this up so that members have an opportunity to try to amend it on the floor. And I think it's, you know, uh, I support the gentleman's amendment. Okay. Further discussion? Vote will now be on the uh, Hastings Amendment. Those, aye. Fa those in favor, say five saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no? No. no. I ask for no roll call. Gentlemen, ask for roll call vote. Clerk will poll the committee. Mr. Cole, Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Collins, Mr. Byrne. No. Mr. Byrne, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Buck. No. Mr. Buck, no. Ms. Cheney, Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, five nays. Uh, Members not agreed to for a our discussion. See none, the uh, vote will now be on the motion from the Stings gentleman from, from uh, Georgia. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no? No. Ayes no. have it, ayes have it. for roll call. Mr. Gentlemen, ask for roll call vote. Clerk of the committee. Mr. Cole, Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Collins, Mr. Byrne, 
Mr. Byrne. Aye. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Buck. Aye. Mr. Buck. Aye. Ms. Cheney. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Polis. No. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Clerk will report. Five yeas, four nays. The uh, motion is agreed to accordingly. The distinguished gentleman from Freedom, Colorado, will be uh, uh, managing this for Republicans. And the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings, will handle this. The gentleman from Florida will be handling this for uh, Mr. Hastings. I need to report that we have no scheduled meetings for the rest of the week, but we do have multiple ongoing conferences that I do hope and anticipate they may report this year, uh, this uh, week. And so it's my idea that we will provide that notice as soon as that, that is taking place. Thank you very much. We've now completed our work for the day.